So hello, everyone. Welcome to Power Playbooks. I'm one of your hosts, Sarita Dua, and I've got with me our co-host, Via Williams. We both enjoy hosting this together every Wednesday at noon Pacific time. Our goal is to have amazing speakers like Brian, who we're going to introduce here in a second, where they share exactly what they're doing. They get really tactical and you walk away with nuggets or takeaways that you can apply to your business today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Via to introduce our special guest. Hey, everybody. Um, it's been a few weeks. Miss you. Sarita has been holding the fort down while I've been I've been gone a lot. Uh, before we introduce our guest, I want to ask everybody a favor here. I I, I see some of our, our loyal uh, attendees who come to these every week. I want I want you guys to help us spread the word. I think that because I see you guys come back, I know you're getting value. I, I get a lot of comments and uh, and I just love to see, you know, all of us invite one or two people. Could you do that for us? Would that be something you guys would be willing to do? It would mean mean a lot to Sarita and I and and probably Brian. We're all we're all kind of after the same goal, which is to impact the agent community, right? And that that's really what what we're trying to do. Speaking of Brian, many of you recognize this guy. His name's Brian Gubernick. He's absolutely amazing, amazing human, as well as an amazing uh, real estate mind, right? He's really one of the thought leaders in our space. He uh, he owns many businesses, including a, a real estate team in Phoenix, Arizona, a coaching company called Metrics Coaching with Ben Kinney. He's a, a phenomenal investor and um really kind of a wealth trainer in that in that space. Uh, Brian, I, I know you have other businesses that I'm not aware of. You have a, a lovely wife and, and two lovely daughters. I, I got the privilege of meeting your mom, who you work with. You seem to have a great family. Uh, so welcome. And I'm so excited about our topic today, which is crazy because it's on taxes. Yes. And we're going to make that exciting. Uh, but thank you so much for having me, guys. I, I, I really appreciate it. You know, I I love you both. I've known you both for a while as uh, as fellow realtors, but as as leaders and and friends in this industry. So it's really an honor to be here. I'm excited. And and via when you run through kind of that that resume, number one, it's super uncomfortable. So uh, thank you for <laughs> doing that to me. Mission no, accomplished. Yes, but but number two, uh, like both of you, uh, we've been fortunate to have a few years in this game and, and wear multiple hats and have a few wins and have a few losses. I think fortunately in this game, you just try to get a couple more wins than you have losses and you come out ahead. And so it's been a journey. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, today's topic, I mean, is a little bit, I think, unique in that, you know, we're going to talk tax and we're going to talk wealth. And this stuff is incredibly important because why are we playing the game? Right. Like, yes, it's to help people achieve the dream of home ownership. And that feels great. But at the end of the day, we're running businesses. And the goal of any business is to make money, is to make a profit. But then how what we do with that profit, I think, is so darn important. And the, the conversation tends to fall off at that point. OK, you got commission, you've got net income. But in our industry, conversation almost freezes. It's like, OK, now what? You know what? Now what? How do I stave off the largest expense that I have? That is tax. And with the, with that, how do I take those dollars and make them work for me? Different conversation when we start talking about wealth building. But today's a component of that. A component of that when we talk tax. I can love I, it. Can I add something in there super quick because he, here's what I've learned about learning about taxes. Because I, immediately people tune out when you start saying taxes, right? What I've learned is if if we would have said, Brian and Sarita, come to this hour webinar, 30 minute webinar, however long it is, and make $50,000, right? How many people would have signed up, right? Literally make $50,000, make $100,000, make $200,000, depending on whatever. That's exactly what this conversation is. People will make more money doing what you're going to talk about today than selling multiple houses actually in a lot of cases and and the irony i mean there's different ways to make money to brian there's a progression and we actually try to work through that progression in these webinars right which is work on yourself work on your business work on your business profit right 
you know, get profitable. And then to Brian's point, then now, you know, then there's investments and then there's taxes, tax strategy. So I, I just wanted to throw that out that they, there's a lot of money to be made in these conversations if we view it that way. Yeah, we're literally going to go through an exercise during this during this conversation. I mean, this whole conversation is based around an exercise where we essentially save eighty thousand dollars. It's crazy when you think about it. When we when we talk around P and L and we start our, our, our profit and loss and we start managing our money like a, like a true business person and having an income statement and looking at our expense items, we think about that from a business perspective. But the truth of the matter is that every one of us that's in business, our largest expense on an annual basis are our taxes. Yet they oftentimes are given the least amount of consideration. It's almost like an afterthought, like, oh, shit, I guess I made a bunch of money and now I've got to pay taxes. Well, that's, that's not true. Yes, you have to make your contribution. Don't get me wrong. But you shouldn't be overpaying that contribution. And that's that's what I think we're going to be talking about. I love that. And as you tee this up, Brian, I, I think we want to acknowledge that everyone watching this, they can be at any part of the spectrum. They can be loving taxes, taxes, really getting into it and looking for just some nuances on how to tweak what they already know, or maybe add in a different layer. And then you could be on the other extreme, which is like, you have a, vis a physical reaction, <laughs> a visceral reaction of like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to talk about it. I hate data. I hate numbers. I hate spending money. I can, I hate making all of this to just give it all up. And the goal is wherever you are, be open-minded. There will be something here for everybody. Yeah. I love that. And I'm going to, I'm going to share the, the slide deck that I put together as I'm doing that. I'll make this a slideshow so we can see it. Does that look good? Yep. Looks great. Okay. So as we're doing that, um, Sarita, I think what you just said was so important around you know, if this gives you a visceral, like, oh, I don't want to think about this or touch it reaction, I don't necessarily expect everybody to have knowledge to the extent that we described it today or have to know this inside and out. But here's what I, I think is important, for, for especially for those that want nothing to do with this stuff. You've got to be informed to the levels that you can sit down with an accountant on a regular basis and have a, 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 a conversation collaborate like you th there's no good excuse for not having working knowledge around some of these concepts now what we're going to talk about just write down the term right just just understand what the term may be or the strategy may be and then like our good friend tom wheelwright teaches us and we if you, if if many of us in the real estate industry are familiar with tom wheelwright as a matter of fact we've had him at built how and i i believe we'll have him you know coming up again Tom will share that it's, you just got to know how to ask the question. And the question always is, as you know, Via, how can I do this? How can I leverage this depreciation Brian was talking about? How can I leverage this Augusta rule that was brought up? How can I do that? That's what you need to know. So again, you don't have to know the stuff inside and out. You just got to be knowledgeable enough to go sit down with the accountant on a quarterly basis and plan. Make sense? That sounds awesome. As you jump in, I want to make sure everyone knows we're monitoring the chat and you can definitely uh, ask questions. We'll be bringing them up to Brian and then he's going to save a little bit of time at the end to answer as well. Go yes. ahead and jump right in. This All right. Awesome. I'm, I'm jumping in and Sarita, via, please feel free. Chime in. Actually, I don't have to encourage the two of you to chime in. That's not going to be a problem. So... <laughs> We're going to oh, get Brian. It is not a problem. <laughs> yeah. He'll be like, chime out, chime out right now. <laughs> <laughs> On that note though. And I, I want everybody to like, stop doing what you're doing and hear me. I, I am not a CPA. I am not licensed to give tax advice. Now, as, as you, I, Via didn't mention this in my resume, in my bio. I thought about it. I, I yeah, I, I did come out of college as an accountant and worked two years and failed my CPA exam, therefore I'm not licensed. So I do have a little bit more knowledge than, than most, uh, but that was a little while ago. So what I'm gonna share with you today, I'm not your accountant, I'm not licensed to give tax advice. These are my personal experiences. This is what exactly what I'm doing in my tax world. And my again, my hope is you take this knowledge, right or wrong, and you bring it to the accountant and you say, how can I do what Brian described? 
And you may hear you can't, which may mean you might want to go find a different accountant, different conversation, but uh, I'm not the one giving you advice. I'm just trying to share with you my experience. So here's the way we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to actually run through a hypothetical tax scenario. And as we run through it, we're going to touch on a variety of things that I think will teach you the concepts or the thoughts or the things that you need to be asking your CPA about as we get into, uh, for those that maybe are still filing for 2022 because we extended, or as you're tax planning for 2023, you want to be asking these questions. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to imagine that um, you made $250,000 in income. So you figure as a realtor, you're doing $10 million in volume and a 2.5% commission, 250K in gross commission income and income. Now, in this example, let me, let me change that a little bit. We're going to assume the 250 is your net and that you already took advantage of all of those standard common deduct deductions. So as you're on your tax return, as you may know, you've got a number, you've got a bunch of like deductions, itemized or standard deductions, and then you have an adjusted gross income, AGI. You have that number. That number multiplied by the tax brackets in which you fall, like it's a progressive rate, will spit out a number that you owe the IRS. So let's make believe that you just do what the average person's doing, which is you know, standard, maybe maybe you itemize, but it's very common standard deductions, uh, whatever it may be, 250 is your net, you'd be paying via somewhere around 70 to $80,000 in tax. This would put you at a 32% tax rate, but not to get too granular, you don't pay necessarily 32% times the amount, it's progressive, it works its way up to that 32. Point being though, you're gonna pay 80 grand in tax. Now, what we're going to talk about is how that number could be dramatically different or could potentially be zero in this exact same scenario if you became a slight bit more knowledgeable about taxes and the strategies you could deploy to lower that tax bill. So we're going to go through different steps. Just play along with me here. So now let's make believe we're going to be different. We're going to do things differently. You see a lot of words on the screen. Let me talk to you about it. First thing that we could do, and both of you, Sarita, Via, I know have done this multiple times over, and you've seen the tax benefit to doing it. So first thing we should be doing, just as realtors alone, we should always be thinking about investing in the industry we know best. But we're going to be purposeful for tax purposes. We're going to buy an investment property. So let's say we buy a second home and we rent that property out for all or a portion of the year. Now, as an investment property, we get to depreciate it. Now, the standard depreciation is just a straight line, same amount deduction every single year, unless, unless you leverage what's called cost segregation. Now, Two, three years ago when I would talk around cost segregation, uh, very few knew what I was talking about. Today, um, I think a lot more of us attending here, to, you know, you're probably familiar with it. Maybe you're not leveraging it, and I'll tell you, you're, miss, you're missing out at a huge, on a huge level. So in this example, let's say I go buy a $400,000 property. I put 10% down, so $40,000 down. And then I cost segregate that property. What is cost segregation? I'm going to give you the Brian Gubernick definition in like 15 seconds. Rather than straight line depreciating the home, saying the home's worth X, and we're going to divide it over 27 and a half years, we're going to say, we're going to segregate components of that home. And we're going to say, hey, certain things in this home are not going to last that long. They've got a five-year or a seven-year or a 15-year life. So what you're going to do is take that segment and condense the period by which it's going to be depreciated, which would accelerate or increase the amount that's being depreciated in year one. Does that make sense? So we're accelerating the depreciation 
on the property using cost segregation. Now, these reports are just done by a CPA. Some of them do it. There's specific cost segregation engineers. Whatever the case, a decent rule of thumb, and this is a little aggressive rule of thumb, but the, the way I look at this is if I've got a $400,000 property and I have $40,000 out of pocket, there's a hundred or so to $120,000 first year depreciation expense when I do, when I cost segregate a property like this. The numbers come down a little bit this year because some of the some of the uh, bonus depreciation changed in 2023. So it's not as fruitful or as beneficial as it was in years past, but let's be super clear, it is still a mess. So just this one thing alone, if I had 250 in income and I subtract that 120, I've now reduced my income to $130,000. I took a $40,000 investment on the down payment, but I've reduced my income to $130,000. Does that make sense? So that difference, that 120, um, if you figure you saved that $120,000 at that tax rate I gave you earlier, you can back into the math, the savings, just in buying that investment property, massive. I'm gonna pause for a second. Sarita, Via, what am I missing here or what did I not uh, say as clearly as I should? How much does it cost to get a cost segregation? And, you know, I mean, there are specialists, but maybe you can just super briefly um, kind of just kind of touch on that. Yeah, the 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 cost that, and I can tell you my my experience only, right? There are lots of different companies out there, lots of different CPAs. Uh, this property, I mean, this is not a, this is an example, but I mean, it's a real life example. Uh, that's a $1,500 to $2,500 expense, depending on uh, where the property is located uh, and the length of time it may take to do that report. Again, if it's a normal property, not a big deal. I just ordered a cost segregation on a property in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, $330,000 property, six bedrooms. Uh, it is a $1,750 invoice. Brian, is, is, is there like a time frame? you know, sort of when you buy a property, do you have to cost segregate within a certain amount of time? Such a good question. Uh, the answer is no, you can actually go back for all the properties that you've purchased and cost segregated today, just keep in mind that you've likely already depreciated some amount, so the basis has lowered, and so the benefit may not be as substantial as it would have been in year one in that respect to tax year, right? So if I waited three, four years on this particular property, I've already accumulated some depreciation, and so the benefit in the year that I cost seg would not be as significant, but you absolutely, if you have properties right now, you can do it. I'll give, I'll give you another example. V. I just had a conversation with a guy uh, who, uh, this was actually yesterday, I was having breakfast with him. He bought a new home to live in and he kept his old home. And the old home That's a good one. that he is now turning into a short-term vacation rental, which he bought for, I don't remember the exact math, but it was like he bought it for 500K and then he put in another 500 over the years in remodeling and renovations of costs. So his cost basis in this house, the day he puts it into service, and now it's a million dollars, immediate, like he's going to segregate that property. It's now a rental, and he will reap the tax benefit of it because he bought. So he bought a new home, and the down payment of that new home via was more or less subsidized or canceled out by the amount of tax savings he's going to have when he places this other this old home of his into uh, okay, investment great. status and, and depreciates. Kind of interesting great. when you think about it like that. Right. Ryan, as I'm listening to you, I don't know if this is maybe not really a question, but kind of an observation, and you tell me if I'm on the right track. When I listen to this, I think, man, why doesn't everybody do this? It just makes so much sense. And then I think about you know the IRS and in general taxes, right? They've it's supposed to be simple for the masses. So it's like turbo tax. And then maybe you get a CPA and the CPA sort of stays in the box 
with regards to what applies to the most people, we're starting to get really specialized. There is a little bit of effort to think differently as well as spend some money, but it's there's a huge reward here, which is doing it. And the reason that a lot of us don't do it is that, again, we sort of play in the lowest common denominator of like, this is, I got to do it. I got to get it done. And even the rules that are presented to us are, you know, these are sort of specialized versus what appeals to everybody or what applies to everybody. And it's really worth looking into. And what I also heard you say is it's not too late. You get the most benefit from doing it from the beginning, but you can go back and just be like, I, I missed the boat when I bought my property, my beach house in 2017, but here I am in 2023. I can still do it now. Yeah, you know, uh, there's a, there's a lot there, Sriti. I mean, you nailed it. One thing I'll tell you what changed my mindset around a lot of this. Sometimes people say, "Well, gosh, that seems aggressive," or, or uh, you know, not paying your taxes. I don't know if that's the right thing to do. And by the way, you are paying your taxes. I'm just saying, pay the right amount. But here's what changed my mind around a lot of this: when we save, when I save money in the manner that I just described here. The idea is I'm not just hoarding this cash. I'm contributing that those dollars saved in other ways to stimulate the economy in that I'm going to go buy another investment property and create a new you know, uh, housing unit. Or I'm going to go deploy that capital in building a new business. Or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. The idea here is not that I'm going to hoard these dollars and there's not some public, there's not a public benefit to it. We are incentivized by the government. Like as Tom Wheelwright says, the vast majority of the tax code is written for you to save money and become a better business owner, become uh, someone that has more dollars to deploy into the economy. We are incentivized to create or stimulate the economy. That's exactly what this is doing here. Giving me this tax break, but then encouraging me to continue to go do it by buying more properties and creating more housing, these are, this is the benefit of it. So it's not doing wrong, it's doing right by the economy, by the government at large, in the society at large. Brian, that was my game changer as well, that when someone explained to me that the tax laws were actually designed for us to use them, like, like that they're there as they want to incentivize us. Like it's the opposite of, you know, not paying your fair share. It's actually doing what they're designed to do. That was a game changer for me as well. I was like, oh, we're not manipulating. We're actually, that's what they're here for. They're incentivizing a behavior and I am acting on that behavior. So yeah. in my thoughts, I think that if you give me back the dollars and let me go deploy it, I don't know, maybe this is the wrong thing to say, but I, there's a good chance I might do a better job deploying it than the government. Than the IRS. Should I pay the IRS and say, hey, you know, guys, go figure out what the I don't know. It's a long shot, but as far as efficiencies, I'm gonna go ahead and vote for Brian Sarita and yeah. the, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> all right, next thing we can, next thing we can do. Uh we've all heard, or maybe I should say we've all heard. There's a section 179 uh coded within the within the within the tax code. Uh, where you can buy property and provided that it's used more than 50% in your business and it's not acquired from a related party, you can actually write off nearly 100% of that vehicle. Section 179, like vehicle, it, it applies to physical property beyond just vehicles. But in this particular example, again, remember, we're trying to eliminate that $80,000. And here's one, here's another method to doing that. We can go buy an SUV and this SUV qualifies because A, it weighs over 6,000 pounds, which is the requirement. B, it's being used uh, in the business. Now, guess what? We as realtors, we have cars. Those cars are used like 172% for, I mean, like we go above and beyond in those vehicles. These vehicles are in fact assets that can be depreciated or can be written off at an accelerated rate. Section 179 plus a bonus depreciation, which, like I said about segregation, has been scaled back a little bit in 2023, went from 100% to 80%. But just for sake of this conversation, we're going to act as if, again, we're just trying to illustrate the, the, the math or the concept, I'm sorry, and just get a little bit of math behind it. Going and buying a car 
you could potentially write that whole amount off if it meets certain requirements. So the focusing question or what we should all be asking is Mr. or Mrs. Accountant, I heard from via Sarita and Brian that if I buy a car and it meets the requirements of section 179, I could write off a substantial amount of that, that car in year one. How do I go about doing this? That's what you're asking. In this example, we're gonna say we bought a car for $60,000. Used car, new car, doesn't matter, just has to meet the requirements. As a matter of fact, literally right before this, I was on uh, I was online looking at used Chevy Tahoes for, for my family. Now, that can't just be a family vehicle, right? It's gotta be 50% plus in the business. And for me in the real estate game, like when I say for my family, we drive it on road trips and things like that. I have to replace the old Tahoe that is A, about to die, but B, you know, I'm looking for another tax incentive or tax benefit. So there's one play for me. If I need a new vehicle, I might as well make it such that there's tax savings. Now, there's different ways to maximize cars. There's, you know, should I lease, should I buy? These are all conversations for your CPA. For sake of this exercise today, we're buying a $60,000 car that qualifies. Fair enough? Well, yeah. And driving around Seattle, when this law, I remember when this tax law came out, because this was the year that the realtor, like the car of the year for realtors was the Lexus SUV. And to this day, I see a Lexus SUV, you know, the little, like, I'm like realtor car, because everybody, I remember we were, everybody was running around buying like the minimum SUV you could buy that was 6,000 pounds. It was like, Maybe that's Seattle. I don't know. Maybe we're nerds. No, here. no, no, no. The RX Lexus was the was the See, popular choice. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh no, no, no. It was like six thousand and one pound, basically. Yeah, I know. It was like everybody went like in the next year, everybody had a Lexus SUV. Oh, so there, there's I mean, you could get really geeky with it. Is it the curb weight? Is it the gross vehicle weight? You could actually go Google what qualifies and you could find a lot, like a whole list of, of that's those funny. products. But again, before you go do this and say, Brian said you could buy a, this car, run it by your accountant. Now, next thing we can do, you can read it right here. If you have a home office, you can deduct a portion of your utilities, your maintenance, and even a cost of the house. And I, I mentioned pandemic because while, we've, while we're past that, many of us carved out spaces around our house and we're still working out of them. Now, when I say carve out, I don't necessarily mean you built a home office, though, again, many of us did, myself included. Uh, I mean, you, you, you kind of took a portion of the home and roped it off and said, nobody's allowed to come here. This is, this is mom's space. This is dad's space. And you've kind of taken over that, maybe you know, built some barriers with books or whatever. Maybe that was just me before I built a home office. But the point is, if you created a home office, you can deduct a portion of all that goes on. So a portion of utilities, of the maintenance, and you can even say, hey, here's the amount of square footage that I took over in this house. That's how I'd be allocating it. Again, the accountant can work with you on this math. You can do it. Now, some will say, well, can you do this if you have a, uh, uh, an actual office office? And I can only tell you what Tom Wheelwright and the CPAs I work with tell me. And the, the answer is absolutely. But I'm not saying make stuff up. We got to be super clear here. For me personally, I work from home three days a week. So I've got to figure out a pro rata, like what the math looks like. What's the pro rata share of the house in terms of utilities, et cetera. And then the number of days I'm using it, right? So, and that's true math. And then I also have my office space and I'm paying a bill on that office space as well. I'm actually paying a mortgage on it, but I'm paying a bill. So there, these things can be done. The old adage of, oh, well, isn't that a red flag? I mean, maybe, but if it's all legit, what's it matter? The truth, the, the key here is to be honest. I think where people have challenges, Sarita Villas, where they start making up these things that don't really exist, 
But hey, I'm working from home three out of five days a week. I know both of you work from your home offices from time to time too. In this particular case, we're going to say there's $12,000 that's being allocated to, towards home office expenses. Many people have double digit thousands, you know, 10K plus in home office expenses that they never think they can do anything with. Guess what? You're wrong. And by the way, mileage is a really fascinating one. That's why you see bonus there. We're not going to go too far into this, but if the way you the way you calculate mileage, if you're not working from home, you have to deduct the round trip mileage from your house to your office before you start counting additional mileage. Well, if you're at home, if you have a home office, where's your mileage start from? It starts from zero because you're going from your front door and back. Just something to make note of and maybe ask your accountant about if you're tracking mileage as a, as a deduction and you're working from home, how might that play into the calculation? So for sake of this exercise, 12K towards home office expenses in this example. Brian, my aha there is that with the pandemic, so many of us have changed behavior, like you said, but we've never went back and changed our taxes. So we may have been working from home occasionally. Now we're working from home more regularly. We might have been working from home regularly, and now we're working from home all the time. If you don't go back and revisit it with your tax planner and your advisors, you're leaving money on the table. You've got to ask the question. Yeah. I mean, that, that should be the theme of today. You've got to ask the question. Like shame hey, on you if you don't ask, how could I, not can I, this is one of, this is a Tom Wheelwrightism. It's not, can I deduct my home office? It's how can I deduct my home office? Go ahead, Via. Brian, if you haven't done any of this, Richie Laser is asking, if you haven't done any of this, and then it's a great question. It's actually, I want to ask this question too. And then all of a sudden one year, you just start doing all of it. Is that a red flag at all? I mean, I'm not the accountant here, but I, I again, if you're doing all the, it, these are, dare I say, you're correcting for a mistake, not going above and beyond what, what a normal person should be doing. In other words, if you haven't been taking advantage of these various opportunities, they're all normal opportunities. You've just been missing out respectfully. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you now taking advantage of these things that are on the IRS tax code of 1986 and spelled out, but the vast majority, here's a better way for me to word this. Please keep in mind that when you go to your accountant, when I go to my accountant, uh, there isn't an incentive sometimes for them to come to me and, just, and say, hey, Brian, you're missing out on this, you're missing out on that. They're not paid on contingency. In other words, my accountant is not paid by the amount of dollars they save me. I kind of wish they were, but they're not. How are they paid? They're paid a fee for their services. They're paid a fee for completing the project. They're not paid a fee for the success. So where, are, where am I going with this? It's not surprising then, given the nature of the, the structure of the relationship, why they don't come to me saying, hey, we ought to evaluate home office or we ought to evaluate cost segregation. You wish they would because it's honorable or it's, it may be showing them as proactive, looking out for your best interest, but a lot of them don't. So if you're mad about your accountant right now, eh, maybe you should be, but maybe you shouldn't be because you should have been driving some of this conversation as well. Um, Brian, Jan uh, Hungate is asking, if you deduct for a home office, don't you have to recapture that when you sell later? Yeah, there are some things. Well, do you have to do you have to capture, recapture? I guess it depends. When I say deduct for the home office, I'm also like I'm taking into consideration things like utilities and maintenance and things of that nature. So those are true expenses. There are some things that maybe you have to recapture. I think it's going to be very specific to you, right? Like it's going to be very specific. Like, is that part of the the gain, could that gain, does it fall under the 250K or 500K exclusion on principal residence? Like there are some things to debate there. I'd have to defer to the accountant on that one. Next thing, again, something that wasn't discussed a few years ago, but now seems to show up everywhere and that's paying your kids. You could hire your kids as employees 
to do legitimate work in your business. And you can deduct their compensation from your business income. For me, Sarita, I have two girls, 12 and 10. Both of them get paid $13,850 or call it $1,150 per month. And they have responsibilities and a job with my companies. Now, my two girls, what are those jobs? Like they have to be real legit jobs. I, you can't, it's very difficult to say my kid comes in the office once a month and, and, and stamps some envelopes for me and say they deserve nearly $14,000. For me, in my world, uh, my girls show up at my training events and my mastermind events at Metrics, and they present and they work the room and they help with logistics, like managing it. Now, some would say, well, gosh, that still doesn't sound like a $14,000 job. I'll tell you what, in my business, just call it what it is. I'm just being fully transparent. Image matters. Like I am portraying myself in a certain way. And I show my family and my kids there to support that image that's important, right? Like people align with me or align with my events or align with, you know, my beliefs. And I want to showcase that. So I would contend there's immense value in seeing these girls I talk about go to work and do the things that we talk about at our dinner table. And so for those watching today, you all market. You all have image-based businesses. Many of you run events. Some of you have mailers, right? So who are your models? Who's who? Like literally, who's showing up in your ads? Who's rep, who's showing up to your events, representing you, representing the family, right? Now, mind you, there's also grunt work that could be done in the office. There's a whole plethora of things that kids can be doing and working in your business. Now, I'm able to pay my daughters. And in this particular case, in this example, we're going to say two kids, $27,700. That's an expense to the business. And it's going into the respective accounts of each kid. Now, that's key because it's not like you just, you pay them and you sweep it right back. That would make this illegal. My kids get paid and my kids pay for their own expenses. What are their expenses, Sarita? Well, they go to dance, which is more expensive than the salaries that they have, but that's a different conversation. Uh, they go on vacations. They just happen to be with my wife and me, but they buy their own flights. They pay for their own dance. And it could be whatever, but remember, they have their own accounts and they're making their own payments. And that's what, well, legitimizes, money that's too. what, that's what legitimizes this. Now, what do they also do, Sarita? They both contribute to their Roth IRAs. So I'm in year seven or eight of doing this. And you could do the math. You have seven or eight years of maxing out an IRA, a Roth IRA. Let's just say over the years, it's roughly five to six K. You can, you can just contribution wise, both kids have put in roughly $50,000 into the Roth IRA, which is not taking into consideration the appreciation of those respective accounts. Yeah, and I want to asterisk one thing too is look around. There's so many things your kids are actually better at than you are. My daughter cleaned up my database and still does. She designed, she found an app to deliver drop-offs for, for the holidays where she did, built out a circuit. They, during COVID, when we were stuck at home, they went and dropped off a bunch of things and they were way, they enjoyed it more and were way more efficient. My son came up with a VIP client ambassador program and a newsletter with all the graphics. He ripped, the, he whipped that out in a way that would have taken me weeks to plan and then someone to hire to actually execute. And he just did it. So there's a lot of things our kids can do that based on their age and how they grew up with technology, that's just a no brainer for them. And we may still fumble around. So it's not just taking money, as Brian said, out of one pocket and putting it in the other. It's actually transferring it to their pocket and teaching them the value of money. Oh, it's, it's so good. It's, it's important, right? It is at, like absolutely teaching them how to manage money. Like when you're paying for dance and when they're paying for travel that, you know, they don't get a say in that. They're paying for those things. Um, but I mean, literally, even at our dance school, Sarita, both girls have debit cards down and there's auto withdrawal out of their respective accounts. And that, again, is what's legitimizing 
these sorts of things. And if you have to buy lunch for them or an ice mocha every day, um, and it's your if it's your money, they're happy to have that. The minute you say here, you know, here's your money, and you guys pay for it, they're having water, <laughs> they're having a sandwich, they're bringing a sandwich from home it's because it's very different when it's your own money. That's right. That's right. All right, so we're going to get to the to, to the final thing. Yeah, I would just say about five minutes, and we'll kind of wrap up. And and but I don't want to rush you, but just for time. Like, no, 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 we're, we're we're getting there. And and, and so this is quick. Uh, the note to take here: it says maximize your retirement contributions. Every one of us has a slightly different scenario. Um, whether we can we can invest in these respective uh, areas, like a solo four hundred one k or a standard 401k, whatever it may be, or SEP, we all have different things, um, depending on your status, your employment status, uh, and the amount of money you make, things of that nature. Bottom line, many of us can be maxing out retirement contributions, in particular, the so solo 401k. Max in 2023 is $66,000 into a retirement account. So let's say for sake of this conversation, you contribute 66K to a 401k. Now the bonus here, I mentioned this, kids can contribute to the Roth IRA because you just were paying them. My kids this past year contributed $6,500 each to their respective IRAs. You also have an HSA contribution. 2023, the max HSA contribution, um, which is your health savings account was 7,750. If you have a high deductible insurance that you got to make sure qualifies, you can get an HSA. I think many of you are familiar with this. And the HSA, you can contribute a max amount, $77.50. And those dollars can be invested in the stock market or other places, just like the Roth, just like the 401k. So for me, Sarita, when I all of my HSA funds, which I contribute to every year, they're presently sitting in a in a Vanguard index fund, growing. Now I use those dollars for health costs, but for the most part, I'm relatively healthy and I knock on wood, do not have to leverage those dollars all that often. What a great way to contribute and save money from a tax perspective. The, the last thing I wanna mention, again, something we didn't talk about a few years ago, but is so super popular today is the Augusta rule. This is section 280A. And what it essentially says is that a homeowner can rent out their home for 14 days a year. Can't be more than 14. If you go to 15, you violate the rule. 14 days per year without reporting that rental income on your tax return. So I can rent my house right now as a Verbo or an Airbnb for 14 days and all of the income I receive 14 days or less, all the income I receive is non-taxable. Doesn't go on my tax return. Now, where's the savings? As you see in that second, that, that second uh, paragraph there, you can rent out your business. I'm sorry, you can, your business can rent out your home from you to hold bona fide events and or meetings at the house. So in this particular example, we're going to say, Every month, we're renting our home out to our business for $3,000. That's the cost. Therefore, we're going to end up with a $36,000 expense to the business, and the income on the personal side is non-taxable because of this Augusta rule. Now, why $3,000? Well, what I would encourage you all to do is go look at what it would take if you're going to have an all-day meeting at a hotel or other some other sort of venue? What will it cost for the actual room rental? What would it cost for AV? And whatever comes along with that room? Internet, yeah. Internet, no. all that, what would it cost? Now, $3,000 where I live is actually lower. If I went to, I'm in Scottsdale, if I went over to like the Westin Kirlin, I'd pay closer to five dollars or $6,000 for the day. But in this particular circumstance, I'm saying it's three thousand dollars to rent my home. Now, what are you holding? Maybe it's team meetings, maybe it's some other sort of team event, whatever it may be. Within your real estate business, you can rent it out. You can rent that home. The uh, real estate business can rent it from you, and you can do it now. Create create an invoice between your your business and you personally. 
uh, create uh, minutes, like record notes. These have to be legit. I'm not saying just invoice yourself for $36,000. That's not the way it works. That would be a problem. If you use your house every quarter, so be it. Doesn't matter. But just recognize the business can be billed and that's an expense. So in wrapping this up, Sarita, we're buying an investment property and we're going to cost segregate. We're buying a new car for $60,000. We're going to write it off. We're going to expense 12 k in the home office. We're going to pay our two kids. We're going to max out our solo 401k at $66,000, as well as max out our HSA. And then we're going to leverage the Augusta rule at 12 days, $3,000 a day. We just created $329,000 in expense that did not exist prior to this conversation. Well, let me take that back. It existed. We just didn't properly account for it and strategize for it. And therefore, we didn't max it out. So if, in fact, we did that, Sarita, uh, our tax bill of 80 k would be not just wiped out. We'd have a loss carry forward. For the next year, because 250k is less than 330k. Now, what did it take? It took us $120,000. I'm sorry, $40,000 out of pocket to buy that investment property. It took us $60,000 to buy that car. So there's a hard cost here. We 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 paid the kids, but I wouldn't consider that out of pocket because they took over certain expenses. We had to put 66 physical dollars in our, our retirement and 77.50 in the HSA. So out of pocket, we've got, you know, call it uh, 170. So you gotta have some cash available to do it. But I didn't say you have to do all these things, right? Right. These are meant as puzzle pieces in your tax puzzle. Like you put it together and figure out what works with your account. Yeah, and I know Brian emphasized, right? Yeah, he's not an accountant. He's not a tax planner. But the idea is to, again, give you the questions that you need to ask so that you can look at things differently and maximize legally a lot of the rules that are out there that are to our benefit. And it's just starting the conversation and asking the question. And these are great ideas. You can do one. You can do all of them. You can find a way to save to them. Like, okay, I want to go buy an investment property. I got to go save up to do that. Um, but very eye-opening. The the retirement contribution one alone, my CPA tells me you can not do this the SEP IRA, but if you do 66K, just using his, you know, let's just use 33% as a tax bracket rule. Do you want to pay yourself 66K for retirement or do you want to pay Uncle Sam uh one third of that or 22, 22. K more taxes, right? And so it's just like, how do you save paying taxes? and paying it to yourself instead. So there's so much there. Go ahead, uh, Brian, with your next slide. Yeah, next slide here, right? We've got Built How coming up here September 12th through the 14th. Not sure if, if our audience caught it just yet, Sarita, but uh, we announced Jesse Itzler just, just recently. And today- we Just about an hour, hour and a half ago, just hot off the press. Sarah Blakely, is also a keynote speaker at Built How in September in Phoenix. If you don't know Sarah, uh, well, you kind of should. She is the founder of Spanx. She is a billionaire and she is absolutely amazing. Uh, and I always knew she was amazing, Sarita, but now I'm following her on, on Instagram and following, I mean, she's a, she's, we know she's brilliant, but uh, from a mo motivational standpoint, from just a personal growth and development standpoint, she's second to none. I'm so excited to have her at Build Now. It's gonna be it's gonna be pretty amazing. She is the best, and their marriage. If you follow both of them, they could not be more opposite. It's so fun to watch. Jesse is a, an amazing entrepreneur and, and just crazy as well. And they both have an amazing story and have so much sex, so much success behind what they do. Yeah. Um, so the Jesse himself, he's, he's no slouch, right? Founded and sold Marquee Jet, written a couple bestsellers. I mean, minority owner of the Atlanta Hawks. He's done a few things himself. One of my favorite books of of all time is his book, Living with the Seal. Um, so with Goggins, it's an amazing book. He, it's I couldn't put it down. 
Yeah, it is good. I'm actually a bigger fan of, of living, living with monks. If you haven't yeah. read that one yet. It's a good one. It's on my list, actually. Really good. So this QR code, guys, this is your, we want to always come from value at these uh, at Power Playbooks. So this is your 40% discount to join us September 12th through 14th in Phoenix, Brian's hometown. Um, screenshot this slide and you've got the QR code and we'd love to have you um, in Phoenix. It's going to be amazing. It's the event of the year. It's going to be, it, it, we have more people to talk about here to come, but, but these are pretty good headliners right here. So we'll see you there. Phoenix isn't too bad in September either, but I look forward to seeing you all there. Brian, we can't thank you enough. This was super powerful. You took what would be a dry topic to many and made it fun, interesting, and kind of got the wheels turning for me for sure. So I'm hoping for our guests as well. Well, I appreciate you having me. I really do. Uh, you can see I actually get pretty fired up around this because when you save these dollars, now you get to turn around and you get to place them and you get to build wealth. And that's that's really exciting. So I consider tax strategy very much part of the wealth building strategy. And so my hope is you got one or two things out of today. Go ask your go ask your accountant about them. But I'm certain that there's something in today's presentation that you can take. And when you save some some money, please let Sarita and Via and myself know because uh, we love to hear about it. Thank you all very much for doing this with us, though. Thank you. Join us every Wednesday at noon Pacific time. If you have ideas for topics, I'm dropping my email right into the chat. Send me a message directly. We're always looking for amazing topics like this one so we can continue to deliver value to the agent and business community. So thanks again for being here. <music>